Hello and welcome. You're watching France 24 and today we're bringing you a special debate in cooperation with the World Economic Forum. We're in Istanbul where the forum is organizing a regional conference for Eurasia, the Middle East and North Africa. The topic that we're debating today goes straight to the heart of one of the most important issues in global economics and business today, the Eurozone survival. More specifically, we're asking whether or not austerity is the right way to uh, achieve a healthy economic recovery and to restore growth in the Eurozone. This, of course, at a time when some people are saying that austerity risks killing the patient that it was meant to heal growth and the Eurozone as a whole. With me here on stage, I have a distinguished panel from academia, from politics, and from business. Uh, Sir Michael Rake, he is the chairman of the British telecoms company BT. Brendan Howland, he's the uh, Minister of Public Expenditure and Reform of Ireland. John Evans, he's the General Secretary of the, the Trade Union Advisory Committee to the OECD. Xavier Sala y Martin, he's the He's a professor of economics at Columbia University in the United States. And last, but certainly not least, we have uh, Mehmet Shimshek. He's the finance minister of Turkey. Gentlemen, thanks, first of all, for uh, joining us here today at the World Economic Forum. Uh, uh, let me start with you, Sir Michael. Uh, the UK applied a, a series of austerity measures uh, back in 2010 when, when the new uh, coalition government came into power. Two years down the line, where are we now? Has austerity helped or hindered the economic recovery in the UK? I think the answer at the moment is probably neither. The, the real answer starts with the fact that there was no choice. I think the level of debt that the UK had incurred, its deficit, and fiscal deficit, is one of the highest in the world. And I think the new coalition government quite quickly realized, unless it got on top of this very, very quickly, it was likely to spiral out of control. And I think the government had to demonstrate both political will to deal with it and rely on the fact that we still have our own currency and therefore to dramatically control and reduce the cost of borrowing. So I think that was key. I think the, the major concern now in the UK, however, is after this two years of austerity, and by the way, a lot of the cuts haven't even started to come into place yet in the UK in public expenditure, is the other headwinds, the Eurozone going, crisis going on longer than originally anticipated. Do we have an adequate strategy for growth? You know, can we just rely on cost cutting in the public sector? And that's the big question at the moment in the UK. What do we do to get growth? What do we do to get money to the SMEs, to hire people, to reduce youth unemployment, which is really becoming a significant issue? It is the significant issue in the Eurozone as well as in the UK, as you were just uh, mentioning there. John Evans, let me turn to you. You represent around about 61 million workers within the 34 member countries of the OECD. Is government spending making a real difference w with respect to, to employment? As we're seeing austerity measures, for instance, bite in, are we seeing unemployment coming up as, as a direct effect of that? Well, I think the uh, coordinated measures which were taken in 2008, 2009, beginning of 2010, actually had the effect of keeping people in jobs. Uh, if you look at the ILO figures and estimates in, in 2009, they're expecting uh, an extra 52 million people to be unemployed globally. In fact, unemployment jumped by about 28 million, still too much. But the measures that were taken then prevented a complete free fall of the, of the global economy. Uh, in our view, the switch rapidly over one or two months to just pulling away uh, that safety net, that oxygen of the global economy, was too rapid, and it didn't allow the private sector growth to pick up sufficiently to take over the recovery. So uh, now the issue is how do we get growth back into the system? How do we put creating jobs at the center of economic policy? Because unless we can put people back to work, get them paying taxes, get the economy moving again and putting confidence back into consumers as well as investors, then I think the risk of, uh, of debt traps and spiraling deflation is very real. Uh, Professor Saleh Martin, uh, regaining confidence will of course require uh, boosting competitiveness in, 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 in Europe. And we'll, when you look at the European scene, it's often seen as if there is a, a northwestern frugal competitive part, and then in the southwest you have the more, the more wasteful, if you will, uh, economies. Uh, people are probably, or would probably think of Greece first and foremost. But where is, though, the Eurozone when it comes to competitiveness as a whole? How competitive is the Eurozone vis-a-vis 
other regions of the world. I think regaining, uh, uh, regaining confidence uh, requires diagnosing the problem correctly. Uh, and I think that uh, posing the question on uh, whether there should be more or less uh, austerity, more or less uh, government spending is a big mistake because uh, the, there are three big problems, three big areas that require three big kinds of solutions. Uh, one problem is debt. Uh, public debt, private debt, bank debt, uh, that problem should be addressed if we want to, uh, uh, to save European problems. Second is deficits. Uh, third is uh, economic growth. These are three different problems. Of course, they are related. Uh, if you solve, if you try to, uh, if you increase, if you decrease the deficit, you affect uh, economic growth. Uh, if you try to cut the, debt, the deficit uh, to reduce debt, you may affect. So all, everything is, is uh, interrelated. But uh, 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 thinking that you can solve uh, all the problems with one just with just one measure, at least you need three measures, uh, right? One for each problem, uh, uh, and therefore the debate should not be more more uh, austerity, less uh, austerity. Uh, uh, the competitiveness question that you ask is going to be uh, is going to be uh, relevant for the third question, right? Uh, we need the southern European countries, the periphery, to uh, be become more competitive, uh, and for this, there's a whole array of things they need to do. Uh, but don't believe for a minute that if you start growing, you're going to solve the the financial problem, you're going to solve the debt problem. Uh, those require separate uh, separate solutions. I just want to go back to, to a point that you, Sir Michael, brought up before, that uh, Britain back in 2010 didn't really have a choice when it comes to austerity measures. I suppose uh, one could argue that the Eurozone is in much the same seat as Britain was two, two years ago. Minister Howland from, from Ireland, uh, w what do you say about that? I'm wondering whether my country falls into your northwestern um, frugal countries or your southern You're the exception that proves the rule, countries. perhaps. Um, well, I hope we've been either. Um, I think uh, we were the poster boy for economic growth through the Celtic Tiger times. Um, a fora like this, um, Ireland was the, the country pointed to. Um, the core of our problem was a banking issue and the uh, nationalizing of a banking debt. Uh, and that um, recapitalizing of the banks in Ireland uh, cost 40% of GDP, or 64 billion euros. Uh, and that's a mistake that we have to reflect upon now in, into the future. Uh, we have to balance our, our, our budget, um, so the issue of uh, fiscal consolidation is one that has to be faced. But I don't think the issue of fiscal consolidation um, and growth and job creation and stimulus are mutually exclusive. We have to have twin track strategies. Um, we have in Ireland, I suppose, uh, the, 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 the perfect example. We have a dynamic um, industrial base. We have um, growing exports but we have a very flat domestic economy because of the quantum of money that we have sucked out um, in real term probably more than any other country uh, since 2008. Uh, so we need stimulus back to give people confidence again to spend um, and Europe needs to have that strategy. Uh, from our own perspective, I welcome the new focus on growth, um, certainly since the election of Francois Hollande. Um, I think it has gained enormous traction in Europe uh, and we need to have that put into concrete measures now, uh, specifically issues like um, having more paid in capital to the European Investment Bank, um, countries such as my own, um, where it is very difficult for the sovereign to borrow because uh, of our impaired status, uh, needs to be, to be assured that we can have actually drivers uh, for economic stimulus that will create jobs in the medium term. We need to look at uh, the issue of recapitalizing of the banks and hopefully the European stability mechanism itself uh, should be doing that. So it's not impairing the sovereign as we repair the banking system. And of course, um, President Barroso has talked about the, the reassignment, for example, of structural uh, funds. There is a variety of real measures that are urgently needed now. Um, I think we've talked about it long enough, and the response um, seems to be incremental always in the European Union and indeed uh, in the international community. We need to have a clear strategy now that can overcome the challenges faced by a number of countries whose essential economics, like my own, are very robust. You speak there about real measures, and I suppose Turkey is a country that has come up with those real measures because uh, last year we saw economic growth of some 8.5% in Turkey. Finance Minister Shimshek, what are you doing right, and what can the Eurozone learn from you? Well, 
circumstances may certainly be a bit different, but we've gone through quite a bit of adjustment in early 2000, you know, from 2000, 2001 onwards. Our adjustment was actually very large. We had annual primary surpluses in two to six and a half percent of GDP for quite a few years. Uh, so I think through that fiscal adjustment, there was a boost to confidence. Private sector investments, private spending has increased. There was a crowding in effect. But that was because we were fully penalized for irresponsible fiscal policies of 1990s. The problem with Eurozone is that because some of the relatively, I mean, those countries that had poor fiscal positions were not penalized. They had access to capital at very low rates. At the peak, we had real interest rates in this country prior to fiscal adjustment at almost 20, 25% real interest rates. So we were fully penalized. So what happened was, as soon as we start austerity, uh, there was a boost to confidence. So a virtuous circle started. Essentially, private, you know, as a crowding in effect, private sector investments, private spending increased. So public sector retrenchment did not mean weaker banking sector did not mean high jobless rates. In the case of Europe, of course, you have a combination of problems. You've got banks that are already troubled because of toxic assets, real estate bubbles, and of, of course, the value of government papers that they hold has collapsed. So the banks are weak, uh, and, and, and governments are relatively, obviously, fiscally, some governments are in difficult positions. So you really need some outside help. In the case of Turkey, if you go back to 2000, 2001, we secured help from the IMF, but also we did very painful adjustments. So pain at that time uh, you know, was sold to people saying pain today, growth tomorrow, you know, rewards tomorrow. But in the case of Europe, it looks like pain today and pain tomorrow, literally, because uh, there is deleveraging by private sector Banking sector is weak because of other uh, reasons that I explained. And of course, governments are pushing for austerity. So that means lower economic activity. External backdrop is not as strong as is used to be. So you've got a combination of weak domestic demand on the back of deleveraging by private sector, fiscal austerity by governments, and of course, weaker banking sector, which means higher jobless rates, falling economic activity, and actually, you're not gaining anything. Fiscal austerity is not fixing problem. Europe needs growth, but for, for growth to start, you need a significant boost, an external boost. That's why the argument for a bank bailout by a European fund for government, I mean, I know there is moral hazard and all kind of issues, but essentially, there is, need, there is clear need for support uh, from outside, whether that is Germany, but there's a combination of, of other uh, funds. Clearly, something has to be done. I saw several nods there as you were speaking, Minister Shimshek. Uh, John Evans. I think there's a difference between an individual economy which is faced by a, a fiscal crisis where you can take measures which regain confidence, bring down interest rates, and get the economy growing again, particularly if you've got a flexible currency. I think you can't do that at a continental level which is such a large component of, uh, of global GDP. So one size doesn't fit all? Well, globally, you have to get some growth back in the system, and you have to get demand rising again as well. Uh, the IMF just came out with some, a study which suggested that looking at the last 30 years, um, set over 100 examples of fiscal austerity, they do in the short term actually reduce growth. The problem is when that's happening in a continent at the same time, nobody is growing. And I think that's a dilemma at the moment. I also say I think that it's wrong to see public debt as being the cause of the crisis. With one or two countries, that was certainly the case in Europe. But generally, uh, public debt in Spain was lower than that of Germany. It was sometimes debts in the private sector, the Irish banking system, the this real estate uh, in, in Spain. And what we've seen is the growth in debt has been the result of the crisis, not the cause of it. Now, it's difficult to untangle it, but somehow we have to re-inject growth into the system. I don't want to set up any rivalries here, but uh, 
you, Sir Michael Rake, if you were to choose between investing in the Eurozone and investing in the, in the Turkish economy, for instance, wh where would you invest that money? In the short answer. <laughs> in the short term, it's clearly Turkey. But I, I did want to reflect on a, on a couple of the comments that were made about the banking sector. I think this is critically important. I mean, it's, it's dangerous to oversimplify things. On the other hand, unless you see things clearly, you can't understand. The reality is that most Western economies had overborrowed during the boom, both privately and publicly, to varying degrees. The reality is when the music stopped because of the banking crisis and the complete breakdown in confidence in the financial system, actually we kind of run out of, what, uh, run out of the ability to borrow money to solve the problem, to buy our way out of problem. Therefore, I think there was absolutely no choice but for this austerity program to come in. I think there's a real issue now around how you operate with the banks, uh, you know, because there is a huge amount of deleveraging going on. And because the regulators kind of failed to make sure the banks had the right level of capital and liquidity prior to the crisis, we risk now a huge overreaction and a rapid deleveraging of the banking sector, which is compounding the problem of growth. So it's not just the banks have had a problem. They're being actually forced by the regulators to reduce their size dramatically. And the real problem here, and we really have to understand this, is big companies like BT can go to the commercial paper markets and get very cheap finance directly, sort of, you know, from, from the market. SMEs, where the employment's going to come from, can only get it from the banks. And certainly the experience in the UK is very clear. The SMEs who have the assets actually at the moment don't have the confidence, partially because of the Eurozone crisis, to invest. Those who have intellectual uh, property but no assets aren't able to borrow and aren't able to expand. So we're being caught in a, you know, in a real vice-like difficulty. And I think there's a huge need here for really strong leadership at the Eurozone level. You know, it isn't the Eurozone who caused the problem to unlock some of this, to give business the confidence to move forward and invest where they have cash and to sort of create an environment where it's easier for SMEs tomorrow. And at the moment, the uncertainties around will Greece leave you know, what's the position of the banks who have huge exposures to Greece? Will that roll on to Spain? What are the position of unfund, you know, banks who look all right today? Will they be all right if, if Spain gets into really serious issues? Is causing an enormous confidence in crisis, mm -hmm. uh, you know, crisis and confidence. And I think we really, really need to understand that too in order to work through this. It, it's, it isn't just about finding specific measures to create employment. I mean, creating employment through public sector, which the UK did to some degree, you know, you, you see the problem. You've created false jobs. Well, we are, we're, of course, in Ireland um, downsizing enormously yeah. the public sector. Um, we're going to cut the public sector pay bill by a factor of 20% um, by, between 2009 and 2015. Um, the issue in relation to, you know, bad political decisions and bad banking decisions in terms of people lending money, there was also obviously bad decisions on those who lent the money uh, and those who accounted for them, of course, as well. Uh, so there's a shared moral hazard if we're looking at the, the spectrum of moral hazard and we need to address it on that basis. Uh, but Sir Michael is absolutely right in relation to the issue of access to money uh, in an economy such as, uh, as the, the one I uh, am living in is extremely important. And while lots of SMEs actually do want to invest now, um, and the banking system is telling us that there is money available. When you drill down, it's very hard. The conditionality of, of accessing that money uh, is, is such that, in reality, for many SMEs, um, it's not possible. And we need to have a strategy that allows uh, businesses to have access in the medium term to survive and in the medium term to thrive. Professor Saleh Martin. Yes, I think we should not forget uh, that every single economic theory in the history of the world says that if you increase taxes in the middle of a recession, and I'm talking about Keynesians, I'm talking about classics, I'm talking about lunatics, everybody agrees that if you increase taxes in the middle of a recession, the recession worsens. If you reduce spending in the middle of a recession, the recession worsens, okay? Uh, so nobody believes that uh, magically uh, you're gonna, you're gonna, uh, the opposite will happen. Uh, now, whether, this, it might be very necessary to, uh, be, to, 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 to start uh, austerity programs in the middle of recession, but everybody remember that these will, at least in the short run, worsen uh, uh, the problem. Now, uh, all these textbooks at the same time uh, also uh, uh, tell you that there are other kinds of policies that you can engage in when the fiscal policy is not available. 
uh, uh, we're talking about monetary policy, we're talking about exchange rate policy, and we're talking about supply side policies. Uh, that's why I was saying earlier that we shouldn't just engage in the debate more or less austerity. Uh, maybe austerity is necessary, but this is not excuse for not doing anything else. Uh, why aren't we playing with monetary policy? Why aren't we playing with exchange rate policy? Why are we taking so long to engage in uh, supply or competitiveness policies? Uh, and uh, point number two, I want to take issue on the problem of the fiscal problem of Spain. Spain had a fiscal problem even though it was not in the data. Uh, 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 Spain had a, a real estate bubble and therefore the tax revenue was transitorily high. And when the tax revenue was very, very high for a short period of time, the government increased spending permanently. Uh, then, of course, the bubble bursts, uh, tax revenue goes down, uh, you stay with a huge uh, uh, spending and the deficit, uh, and the deficit uh, uh, arrives. And also, uh, Spain had a, a real big uh, uh, public, I mean, uh, uh, private debt bank problem. Uh, government made a big mistake of, uh, you know, the same mistake as uh, uh, Ireland, of uh, saying we will save all the banks. When you say that, immediately all the debt of all the banks becomes public debt. And therefore, the real government debt is really, really big because it's coming. coming. In the next few weeks, we will see how big the government debt actually was. All right, uh, we're going to take a short break now. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Do stand by for us because we will come back uh, straight to this uh, debate. As I say, we're going to take a short break now and uh, we'll be back right after the news. Do stay with us here on France. Thank you. By the magic of television, we shall now resume this debate in a moment. I shall just walk up to this mark right here on the floor. Lubricator is not fun. Just waiting for the go ahead in my ear. Two presenter does nothing, and except for unless someone speaks into his ear. Welcome back. You're watching France 24, and we're bringing you a special debate today brought to you in cooperation with the World Economic Forum. We are discussing austerity and we're discussing growth. In just a moment, we'll pick up our discussion with our distinguished panel once again. But first, though, we're going to bring you a special message from a, a man who's centrally placed in Eurozone politics today. Unfortunately, he could not be here in person, but he uh, recorded this message from Rome. 